guys just kind of think and move on. So we're all set. And uh, I want to finish tonight uh, by kind of uh, looking back over the history of Western science in terms of seven key points. And uh, we'll see that this, impor this is important for, uh, hold on, with respect to uh, what happened to the animistic conception of the world. And we'll start out initially, at least, by polarizing the animistic vision uh, of the cosmos against the mechanistic vision. And we will see how the rise of the mechanistic vision of science dismantled and devoured the animistic vision, and how we are now coming back to a kind of uh, reversal. Now we are seeing in our culture the animistic is coming back, and it's beginning to uh, absorb the mechanistic through uh, things like the personification of machines and you know, popular culture and Star Wars films and science fiction, and HAL 9000, and all of that, we're seeing a, a kind of remythologization of the mechanistic vision so that we will end up seeing that the two are not necessarily uh, incompatible with each other. It just depends on where you put the accent. Now, uh, to recap um, with what we went over last time very briefly with respect to the vision of the universe in terms of the anima mundi, and this is a vision that generally comes to us from Plotinus, and uh, Plotinus had picked it up from Plato, and uh, it's very heavily dependent on Plato, except that he gives a kind of formal uh, symmetry to the whole system that Plato never did. And uh, so we'll remember we had last time the one, which gives rise to the new, the Greek word for mind, the rule of intellect, which gives rise to the anima mundi itself. And then from there to nature, and as we descend this from uh, the one to the created world, we have a movement uh, in terms of material uh, matter becoming more and more weighty, uh, more and more temporal, less eternal, less perfect, and further removed from the divine as we go down this chain. And then uh, nature is built out of a fusion of form and matter. And then... Uh, Below that, you, you just have sort of matter as this passive, uh, formless stuff, which is nothing in itself until it's been imprinted on by uh, form. So the one then, uh, Plotinus said that he achieved union with the one precisely three times in his life. Um, and he said that the one is essentially the Western equivalent of the Hindu conception of Brahman. It is the one undifferentiated substance, the primordial energy of which time and space are manifestations. And it is the goal. Uh, in some of the classical systems of India, for example, to achieve through samadhi uh, a dissolution of one's consciousness uh, into this uh, one, Brahman. Uh, they use the metaphor of the salt doll walking back into the ocean where it merges with the salt of the ocean and it has returned to its undifferentiated state of primal unity. So that is the one and um, Plotinus actually uh, was living in the time of uh, uh, second or uh, third century AD in Alexandria which is in northern Egypt, and uh, this was the sort of terminal phase of the sort of final thinking of the Greek uh, world vision, although the spirit was really changing. It was, uh, you had this sort of proliferation of cults everywhere, and it was out of this proliferation of cults all over the Mediterranean and the Near East that Christianity eventually emerged and was culturally selected as the dominant one of them. But all of these different religions were competing with each other, and syncretism was in the air. So Plotinus comes out of the academic tradition where he has been taught by his teacher, Ammonius Saccas, and Ammonius Saccas was interested in synthesizing the Hindus and Hindu thought together with Plato and Aristotle. So, uh, and this is something that the West did not return to again until the 19th century, starting with Arthur Schopenhauer. Um, so Plotinus decided that he wanted to go to India, and he actually sort of hitched a ride with, uh, I believe it was a uh, Roman uh, troop going there, and they made it as far as Persia, so he never actually did make it to India. But he came back and began to build this fusion of Plato, Aristotle, and uh, Hinduism, and so we recognize that his conception of the one is essentially Brahman. Plato has this conception of the one, but it has a different feel to it. It is the supreme good, and uh, it's a kind of um, ethical or formal one, and it has very little in common with the Hindu conception of Brahman. But now the one gives rise out of itself, its own substance, to mind. The Greek word is new, and the mind is divine, and it is uh, the sort of mind of God, the immanental mind, within which all the platonic forms are situated. And the platonic forms are the prototypes for all the earthly forms. Everything that appears uh, in time is a mere shadow copy of these platonic forms that exist in the divine mind and are the archetypes from out of which uh, 
the universe grows itself into being. There is no creator here. The universe is pouring forth out of its own abundance, its own substance, and is creating. So we have mind, and mind is static and absolutely pure and absolutely incorruptible. It is the realm of pure spirit. And the Christians will later then uh, take out the platonic forms, more or less, and simply insert the angels. So the angels become uh, essentially the Christian equivalent of the platonic forms that exist within the divine mind. And they situate the divine mind within God himself, instead of making the distinction. And um, then we move. New eventually gives rise then to the realm of causes, which is the anima mundi. And the anima mundi turns out to be identical. Um, the anima mundi is incorruptible, but no longer static. It's active. Um, and this is the realm of the spheres, starting with the prima mobile, which is the first cause, a sort of Aristotelian term for the one. And the next sphere down from that is the Empyrean, where in the Christian tradition God sits on his throne. Down from that we have the realm of the fixed stars, the constellations, which were thought to be absolutely unchanging and immutable. And the fixed stars, then we move down into uh, Saturn as the planet uppermost. And then, of course, from Saturn to Jupiter, Mars, and uh, on down into Venus, Mercury, Moon, and the Earth is the sublunary realm. Now everything from the prima mobile uh, to the moon is the anima mundi. And the whole theory of astrology, as it began to emerge, depended on this vision. Because everything influences, everything that is on the Earth is the result of the influence of uh, the powers of these planets. And each of these spheres, these are not just planets now, each planet is itself embedded within a gigantic translucent crystalline sphere. And that sphere is itself made up of a substance called ether, which is almost a kind of living substance. And the only thing ether does, according to Aristotle, is simply turn with perfect circular motion of its own accord. And as these spheres turn, they carry the planets along with them, like air bubbles in a glass uh, container. And as they turn, each one uh, is associated with a note of the diatonic scale. And there's this massive uh, fusion of art and science. And uh, all of this comes together as a sort of single package. And this was the basis for education uh, throughout the medieval uh, world. And um, as the planets exert their influences on the Earth, it, um, and the word influence comes out of this. For example, the influence of Mars is what uh, differentiates, say, a wolf from a lion. The lion is under the influence of the sun. Uh, Mars, uh, under, uh, the wolf under the influence of Mars. Spearmint works because it's based on the influence of Jupiter in combination with the sun and derives its properties. And so all of medicine is thought to have its efficacy based upon planetary influences that are being called down because they're in resonance with the substances that are being used by the physician. So you are actually calling down the planetary influences and they are working through the world. And from out of this you get the whole Renaissance tradition of magic and um, so forth. So the anima mundi is in constant, perpetual, eternal, undissipated motion. And then down below that we have nature, which now then is the earth. Nature is based on a fusion of form and matter, and now forms are corruptible. They come into being and they go out of being, and they go out of being when form departs from matter. So everything in the sublunary world is subject to corruption and generation, coming into being and going out of being. And the soul has uh, descended down through these spheres, and as it has descended, it has taken on the quality of each one of these spheres and is um, covered, as it were, by the body and the body occludes its memory of its divine origin, so that the educational system, uh, the platonic education is, consists in remembering what your soul knew in the world of the heavenly spheres and the new, where the pure forms of knowledge were. And everything that is earthly um, is simply a kind of material condensation of an archetype, a platonic form. And uh, below that, you simply have matter. And as you get into the natural world, um, you have, this is also known as the great chain of being, and this was the unified vision, clear up until the scientific revolution uh, of the Western academic tradition. Uh, in terms of the great chain of being, you had at the top of it, on the earthly realm, you had man, 